So we're in the middle of this sermon series on how faith intersects with life. And you guys are here expecting to hear a sermon about how faith intersects with technology and you're going to be disappointed. (laughs) At five o'clock this morning when I realized I would be standing before you at 11 o'clock, I could not quite wrap my mind around faith and technology, but God did direct me to something that I think will speak to us. I hope it will speak to you this morning, so invite you to join me now in a spirit of prayer. Oh God, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. You are our rock and you are our redeemer. Amen. The scripture that I want us to look at this morning comes from the book of Jonah, but the book of Jonah is a book that really can't be taken apart and preached chapter by chapter. It really is one complete story, and we need to look at it in its totality, but but rather than read the entire story to to you this morning, I just want to refresh your memory about Jonah, and then we're going to read the end of the story together. So... Go back to vacation Bible school days and see if you can remember the story of Jonah. As many of you probably remember, God calls Jonah to be a prophet, to go and speak God's word specifically to the people of Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was no place that any self-respecting Jew would want to go. The Ninevites were pagans. They were enemies to the Jews. They had a history of humiliating the Jews. And so to people like Jonah, the Ninevites were the worst of the worst. Jonah was a good Jew and he had a dilemma because good Jews wanted to obey God. But good Jews would not want any part of Nineveh. So when God called Jonah to go to Nineveh, Jonah pouted. And he ran in the opposite direction from Nineveh. Instead of going to Nineveh, you'll remember that Jonah boards a ship that sails to Tarshish, which is the opposite direction. And the moment that the ship gets out into the sea, the sea gets violent. Do you remember this? The ocean starts to toss and turn. And and the scripture tells us that the sea gets so violent that the ship itself wanted to explode. Now, the pagans who were sailing on that ship, they get scared. They, they didn't believe in God, but they knew that Jonah did. And they realized that Jonah had disobeyed God. And they realized that Jonah was the problem here. So do you remember what they did? They tossed Jonah off the boat and into the water. And immediately the sea settles down. So Jonah's off the boat and in the middle of the deep blue sea. And what happens next? He's swallowed by a big fish, a whale. Jonah lives in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights. Jonah prays fervently to be delivered from the belly of the whale. And God hears his prayer. The whale vomits Jonah out onto the sand on the beach on the outskirts of Nineveh. At this point, Jonah finally gets it. He knows he can't outrun God anymore, so he walks into the city, pouting all the way, and he delivers what can easily be the shortest, worst, but most effective sermon of all times. Jonah stands on the street corner of Nineveh, and he says, 40 days more, and Nineveh will be overthrown. And then... To Jonah's surprise and dismay, the people of Nineveh had the audacity to hear what he said. All of a sudden, the people of Nineveh repent and they fast. The king himself comes down from his throne. He puts on sackcloth and ashes and he issues a decree that not even the animals shall eat or drink everyone Everyone, even the animals, are to fast. Even the animals are to put on sackcloth and ashes. Everyone repents. And that's where our reading for today is going to pick up. So I invite you now to open your hearts and your minds and listen now for the word of God, which is the end of the story. When God saw what they did, 
and how those Ninevites turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he didn't do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, Oh, Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That's why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it's better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down on the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush, but when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said again, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, you are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. It came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 people who do not know their right hand from their left, and also many animals. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It's a great story, isn't it? There's drama and humor and surprise throughout the entire book of Jonah. But in the end, as we stand on the hill overlooking Nineveh, and as we listen in on this heated discussion between God and Jonah, what is it that you and I really discover? This is an outlandish story of scripture. And even though many might debate its historical truth, the story of Jonah is surely true with a capital T. It's true. Because in this crazy outlandish story, what we find is ourselves and God. At the end of the story, as we sit on the hill overlooking Nineveh with God and with Jonah, what I think we find is that Jonah is holding up a mirror for all of us to see ourselves, for us to see God, and maybe to decipher just a little bit more of what it is that God wants us to be in this wild and crazy world. I don't know about you, but this morning, in the midst of the chaos and division that's going on in the world around us, I do so desperately want to know and understand and be aware of what it is that God wants us, the church, to be in the midst of our world right now. This morning, I want to invite us all to be brave enough to look into that mirror that Jonah is holding up, and, and I do think it will take bravery because as we look into that mirror, what we're going to discover are some difficult truths about ourselves and some even more difficult truths about God. You see, when I got that text early this morning from Lorenda asking me if I could preach for her today, I pretty quickly knew that I wanted to go back to this work I had been doing on Jonah. I have worked on Jonah for a few years but over the past few weeks, he has really been on my mind. And so in the pre-dawn hours this morning, when I knew that I was going to stand here in front of you all to preach God's word, God made it pretty clear to me that this was the sermon and this was the text that you and I needed to look at together. It's pretty clear to me. That God is calling our world, our culture, our church. God is calling you and me to take a very honest look into the mirror that Jonah's holding up. 
Is it just me? Or have any of you been troubled at how much division and polarization seems to exist in our world today? Is it just me? Or have any of you been troubled over the headlines of the last few months and especially the last few days? There's so much division within humanity right now. Division that happens over race relations. Division that happens on how we deal with immigration. Division on how we feel about gay marriage. Division on how we feel about gun control. Division over all sorts of political policies. In the world that we live in, there are so many lines drawn in the sand, aren't there? Are you on this side or that side? Are you liberal or conservative? Are you progressive or orthodox? Are you with me or against me? Jonah was really good at drawing lines in the sand. And whether we like it or not, if we look into Jonah's mirror this morning, you and I will see that we are really good at drawing lines in the sand too. Jonah drew a line in the sand between the Ninevites and himself. For Jonah, the line in the sand has everything to do with those stinking Ninevites. Jonah loves God. But he cannot imagine that God would have the audacity to love the Ninevites. You see, they are on the wrong side of the line that Jonah draws in the sand. Jonah and all the righteous Jews are on the right side of the line and Nineveh is on the wrong side of the line. The line separates Nineveh from Jonah and Jonah really likes it that way. When you look into Jonah's mirror, do any of you see someone who has drawn a line in the sand before? Come on. Be honest at least with yourself. Can't you see just a little bit of yourself in good old Jonah? I don't know about you, but if I look hard enough into Jonah's mirror, I am just like him. I'm on this side of the line and I do not want to cross over to that side of the line. But I'm an itinerant Methodist pastor. And I have to tell you, as an itinerant Methodist pastor, I can really relate to Jonah. When I was finishing up my last semester of seminary, I was waiting for my very first appointment in the Texas Annual Conference. My district superintendent had counseled with me and he told me, Holly, get ready and you need to expect to get a call to go to what was known as the most liberal church in my conference. I was excited, and I was eager for that call to come. That's not what happened. The call I got for my very first appointment was that I had been appointed to Lumberton, Texas, to a church I had never heard of. So a few days later, I got in the car, and I drove to Lumberton, Texas, and I met my new senior pastor and my new church, and I quickly discovered that Lumberton was my Nineveh. Now, I have to tell you that in the end, I came to love those precious people, and I carry them in my heart today. They helped me become the kind of pastor that I am today, and I am so very thankful for those people. But back then, I felt an awful lot like Jonah, and I was looking for the fastest boat to Tarshish. You see, at that point in time, I understood myself as a liberal, and the church I was going to was known as the most conservative church in the conference. I liked high worship. I liked organs and anthems and Latin and incense. They liked guitar music and drums and clapping. Some of them spoke in tongues. I can laugh about it now, but friends, after my first worship service in Lumberton, I walked across the church parking lot to my parsonage and I laid down on the kitchen floor and I cried. These people, 
They were so different than me. They were strange. They were weird. They were praying for me to get my prayer language, and I wasn't even sure what that meant. I wasn't even really sure they were United Methodist. Their worship was charismatic, almost Pentecostal. They would raise their hands of all things. And honestly, at one point in that very first service, on my very first Sunday, I turned around to make sure there weren't snake handlers coming in the doors. In the end, they were lovely people who taught me so much about God. In the end, I wouldn't trade my Lumberton experience for a million dollars. But in those first days, I had no idea how I was going to survive. I was in anguish because God had sent me to serve people who were on the other side of the line that I had drawn in the sand. I was Jonah and they were Nineveh. Have you ever drawn a line in the sand to separate yourself from some Nineveh in your life? Who exactly are the Ninevites in your life? Are they people who support a different political party than you do? Are they people who have a different value system or moral code than you do? Are they people that are on the other side of an important issue than you are? Or maybe the Ninevites to you are the Muslim or Jewish or Hindu or Buddhist brothers and sisters that we share this planet with. Or maybe you have Ninevites in your own family. Maybe it's the person your son or daughter has fallen in love with. Or maybe the Ninevites in your life are your in-laws. Or maybe the Ninevites in your life are your siblings or your parents or your cousins or your spouse who has wronged you? The truth is, we all have Ninevites in our lives. We all like to pull out big, sharp sticks and draw lines in the sand that separate us from them. If we're honest, as we look into Jonah's mirror, what we discover is that you and I are standing in the sand right beside Jonah, leaning on our big, sharp sticks that we use to draw lines in the sand. But if we look just a little more deeply into that mirror, we'll also see who God is. You and I and Jonah are the great separators in this life, but God... <laughs> God is the great embracer. In fact, in the story of Jonah, it's a story of a God who will pursue anyone with a persistent love that will not quit until there's a moment of embrace. You see, as Jonah sits stewing on the hill outside of Nineveh, he simply cannot see it. But if he just rewind the tape of his life and look back, he would see that God pursued him with more persistence, with more perseverance than God pursued Nineveh. All it took for Nineveh was Jonah's paltry eight-word sermon. That terrible, stinking city on the other side of Jonah's line heard eight words and their hearts were transformed. And then God had the audacity to embrace them. But what about Jonah? And what about you? And what about me? Some of us need a whole lot more pursuing, don't we? Jonah ran in the opposite direction from Nineveh. And God still pursued him. Maybe that's part of your story. It's part of mine. Have you ever been angry at God and stormed off? Has shame or guilt or grief ever made you try to hide from God? Have you ever been so disappointed by God that you just shut down? Have you ever felt abandoned by God and spent days or weeks or months or years pouting about it? You know, whenever we get hurt, 
Whenever life betrays us, whenever things don't go our way, whenever people on the other side of our lines drawn in the sand seem to be victorious, it's so easy for us to swell up and shut down and pout. I don't know about you, but, but I'm a really good powder. In fact, I spent those first six months in Lumberton doing nothing more but pouting. But here's the great good news. No matter how angry, disappointed, hopeless, or pouty we get, God never stops pursuing us. My heavens, he used a whale in the depths of the ocean to pursue Jonah, and he will use whatever it takes to pursue people like you and me because that is simply God's nature. You and I might be the great separators in this world, but God is the great embracer. You know, in my years in Lumberton, I can tell you that God pursued me and embraced me. It was never easy. But once I stopped pouting, once I was willing to erase the line in the sand that I had drawn and cross over it, and love those people on the other side, the strangest thing happened. Those people loved me back. They loved me in a way I'd never been loved. In fact, those tongue-speaking, conservative East Texans accepted me in a way that I'd never been accepted. And in the end, the way that they embraced me and loved me transformed me. Now church, God is calling us to love the world in the exact same way. God is calling university, this church, to be ambassadors of embrace, not separation. God is calling us to do some embracing. The truth is we do live in a world that's divided and polarized. We do live in a world that's filled with tension and rage that can explode in a moment's notice when one side of the line offends the other. We live in a world that loves to separate people according to their differences. But we love a God who is an embracer no matter what side of the line that you're on. God has the audacity to love you and God has the audacity to love the folks who are on the other side of the line too. That's what made Jonah so mad. God had the audacity to erase the line that Jonah had drawn in the sand and God had the audacity to love the people that Jonah despised. There is no one. There is no one that God will not embrace. You know, even though God is the great embracer, God needs us, his body, the church, to do the embracing. You and I, we have a role to be ambassadors of God's embrace in this world a few years ago, I had a wonderful opportunity to do some embracing on behalf of the church. The church I was serving in North Houston that I was at just before I came to university, we had a relationship with a prison in town. And as part of our worship each summer, the, the men in white would come and they would be our choir for worship one Sunday morning. It was always wonderful it was always a good time to hear testimony from people that really were on the other side of almost every societal line. Each time those people came, I would eagerly volunteer to be the pastor that would be with them at lunchtime. I was always glad to sit down and, and visit with them and thank them. And I always told them that when they were released, that I wanted them to remember that our church was a place where they would have friends. Well, one day out of the blue, I got a call from Stephen. Stephen was one of the men in white, and he had just been released, and he needed some help, and he wanted to come and talk to me. So he did. He came, and, and he was exuberant 
He was happy. He was hopeful. He was embraced by Jesus and by God's grace. And he wanted to let me and everybody he saw know about it. He never stopped talking. I listened to Stephen that day and and his excitement was beautiful. But I was deeply troubled by something. You see, Stephen brought his wife Maria with him that day. And the more Stephen talked, the more troubled Maria's face got. Maria didn't speak any English. So I asked Stephen to translate for me word for word, and he did. And and in that awkward three-way conversation, what I discovered is that Maria was terrified. She loved her husband, but she wasn't at all sure about this grace stuff that he was talking about. She loved her husband, but she was scared that he would go back to his old ways now that he was out of prison. She loved her husband, but she wasn't sure that she could trust him. And she had no idea who this God really was that her husband trusted so much. Because if God was good, why was her life so bad? I knew that I needed to find a way to embrace Maria, this woman that was so different from me, this woman that was across the line from me in so many ways, I knew that I had to pursue her with the persistent, transforming love of God. I had to reach her. And between her tears, Maria told me that they were two months behind on their car note and that before they came to the church that morning, they had stopped to plead with the bank to give them another month because they had to have a car because Stephen had to find a job. And without a car, they were hopeless. They, owned six, they owed $600 for their car note. The day before, in worship, the church had collected a communion rail offering of $647 to give to whoever needed it in the community. It was clear to me that God wanted me to use that money to help embrace Maria. Now, the finance director and I got a check together and we went in to give that to Maria. And it was really just a piece of paper. But to Maria, a woman who was so scared, not sure what she could trust... Not sure at all who God was. That piece of paper was God's embrace. And so when I gave it to Maria on behalf of the church, she grabbed me and hugged me and sobbed. And I embraced this woman who was on the other side of the line. I embraced her with the transformative love of God. And the truth is, as I embraced her... God's transformative love embraced me too. I'll never forget that day because in all my ministry, it is one of the most powerful moments where the church got it right. The church got to be a force of God's embrace between two people on opposite sides of the line. And as it always does, God's love transforms the giver as much as the receiver. Friends, there is so much in our world right now that is inviting us to draw lines in the sand, just like Jonah. There's so much in our world right now inviting us to think that people who are different than us should be separated from us. I'm disturbed by what's going on in our world today, and I know many of you are too. But in the confusion and fear and unknowns, You and I have a truth that can direct us. It's a truth that Jonah shows us. The truth is this. There is no line that God's love won't cross. There is no difference that God's love won't embrace. There is no separation that God's love can't redeem. I don't know what lines in the sand have been drawn in your life or what lines you yourself have drawn. But what I do know is that God's love erases all lines. And by God's grace, you and I are called to love, to embrace. But because the truth is God has the audacity to love line drawers like you and me. And God has the audacity to love whoever it is on the other side of the line that you and I have drawn. 
You and I are great dividers. But praise God, God is the great embracer. I pray University United Methodist Church will have the audacity to be a place where lines in the sand can be erased and all God's children can be embraced. I hope you'll join me in that prayer. Amen.